So we're here with Dr. Stringer, and we would like for you to just give us a, a brief introduction of your history and ministry. Name's Phil Stringer. I am, have finished 50 years preaching on a regular basis, 46 years in full-time Christian service. Started preaching regularly when I was 18. And uh, over most recent years, for six years, I've been the vice president here at Dayspring Bible College. For 11 years before that, I pastored the Ravenswood Baptist Church in Chicago. And then 10 years before that, I was the administrator at Landmark Baptist College in Haines City, Florida. Great. And I believe you've also authored uh, several books. Yes, sir. Um, and I know specifically uh, one of those books is called The Unbroken Bible, which talks about the King James Bible and some of the history related. Um, is w have you only written one book, kind of in coordination with the King James Bible, or can you at least describe for us, you know, yeah, this book the, or other that, books? That, you've that's the primary on? book I've written on the King James Bible. Yes. So the Unbroken Bible. Tell us about this book, or how you came to write it, or the history. Well, originally, um, I've actually been dealing with this issue for about forty years. That was never a conscious plan of mine. Probably the first ten years I was a preacher, I took positions that I now think were wrong on this issue. And I got challenged to study it and uh, came to the positions that I hold now. And because I was involved teaching in Bible colleges and speaking in Bible conferences and so forth, folks began to ask me to speak on this and different aspects of it. And it's actually gotten to the place I hold a meeting somewhere about every week and half the time I'm asked to hold meetings on this subject. Like I said, that was never a conscious plan of mine. I never said I want to be a speaker on the King James Bible issue. That is just how it's developed. And um, these, I began as I was uh, speaking on things to try and hit some of the issues that I thought not everybody was addressing or that maybe needed to be clarified better. And I wrote small booklets on those. That would eventually, at the suggestion of somebody else, I gave that person the right to take those booklets and go through and coordinate them and turn them into the book, The Unbroken Bible. In, subtitled The Incredible History, Accuracy, and Legacy of the King James Bible. And I wanted to address some of the things uh, that I think sometimes that even good people uh, might have a little trouble understanding clearly or whatever, and to address some of those things and uh, say things that I thought would be helpful. I want to get a little bit more detail based on something you said because I find it very interesting. You mentioned that you had changed your position. Yes. So can you be a little bit more specific as far as what position you kind of held to how you changed? What position? It wasn't a really well-defined position. Um, the Bible college I attended never addressed this subject. It must have been a conscious instruction to the faculty because in four years it never came up anywhere in any class. And so I wasn't taught wrong. I wasn't taught anything. And so I would pick up a little bit here or there in various books I read, and I constantly read uh, about the Westcott and Hort position and, and things related to that, about older and better manuscripts and so forth. And without ever having done a study of it, I just assumed that was correct because so many influential people had said it. I made a statement once in a preacher's office uh, 40 years ago now that I now would think would be incorrect. He didn't yell at me or criticize me or wasn't rough with me, but he just encouraged me to study that through and gave me a couple of suggestions of books I might go to that would be helpful. And I'd always had a question in the back of my mind about the last 12 verses in the book of Mark. Because, you know, I would read that they don't belong. I'd read that even in my Schofield Reference Bible in the footnote, they don't belong. And that bothered me because uh, either Bible's real clear, we don't take away a word, we don't add a word. And either somebody had stuck 12 verses in there incorrectly, that's a very serious mistake if they had done it, or somebody was trying to take out 12 verses, which would be a very serious mistake if, if they belonged. So after I got challenged to study this issue, I said, you know, I'm going to get an answer on Mark 16. So I took a year, went after everything I could find on the subject of the ending of Mark 16, and, and realized that... Uh, you know, the Schofield notes say, hey, the, the two uh, oldest and best manuscripts don't have it. Man, is that really incomplete when you get to that subject? 
out of the 598 oldest Greek copies of the Book of Mark, or oldest 600, 598 do have it. That puts a different perspective on the subject. And uh, then you find out that all these other early translations have it. And you find all these folks that quoted from it, from the earlier writers of Christianity, and realize that this had been implied. You know, okay, the evidence is kind of against this. Boy, it isn't when you add it all up uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And if you'd had a sentence in the old Schofield Bible that said, only 598 of the oldest 600 manuscripts have this ending, that would have left me with a completely different impression. And, and so then I begin to realize there was more to this whole thing than I was aware of. And over a period of time, I began to address it. And I came to this conclusion, not that I had all the answers then, I don't have them all now. I think I have more now than I had then. But I said, you know, I am going to give the King James Bible the benefit of the doubt. This is the Bible that if you study history that God has used in a miraculous way. And um, if there's something I don't understand, I'm just gonna trust the King James Bible. I'm not unwilling to study or look at anything. But uh, I put my faith in the King James Bible, even though at that time I had a list of things I don't understand yet. Over the years, I've found myself, I think, able to deal with everything that was on that list at that time. I've had lots of other questions thrown at me during that period of time. And as I begin to think about these things and address some of them, I begin to ask, be asked to talk about them and to address, address this subject, this part of it or whatever. And so that built up over a period of time. I ended up teaching courses on this at Landmark Baptist College. I've taught courses on it in other countries, taught courses on it here. I've taught courses on it in some other colleges as a guest professor, Midwestern Baptist College, Calvary Baptist College, King, North Carolina, and some other places. And through 40 years of taking this position, there have been some things that when I was first asked about them, and I'd say, look, I don't know how to answer that. But I come to the conclusion, you know, you give me some time, there's an answer out there for all these things. And I found nothing in 40 years to make me feel uncomfortable or hesitant or to back from that position. The King James Bible stands the scrutiny. Now, there's some folks wave the King James Bible and say foolish things sometimes that don't stand scrutiny. But the King James Bible itself does. And so over those 40 years, I've just grown and grown in my confidence in it. And confidence in it's unlimited. I don't know how to grow any more than it is now. And as time has gone on in different settings, I've been asked to talk about it or address it. To make sure I understand, um, are you saying that your position on the King James Bible specifically changed? Mm -hmm. So just just for you know people out there that are kind of sure. curious about what you said, because not everybody understands you know mm -hmm. the differences between Bibles and everything like that. Just in a real simplistic term, what would you say your view is as like what the Bible was? When you're going to Bible college, I thought the today. King James was just another translation, one among many. And I came to realize, first of all, it's based on a completely different text. A very popular message I have is five reasons why I trust the King James Bible. I realized we were looking at a completely different foundation for the King James Bible and all these other Bibles. It was not one among many. There was the King James Bible and there was the rest. And that... Uh, there was every reason to have confidence that the King James Bible was God's preserved word in the English language. If I wanted to know what God said and I wanted to know it in English, I could go to the King James Bible with absolute confidence. It was not one among many. It was the Bible that was the preserved word of God in the English language, which is a pretty dramatic change from where I started. So would you say that Bible college, or at least the one that you went to, was conducive to the King James only position or was just, how would you describe their view towards the King James Bible? At that time, I couldn't have told you after going there for four years. I know that sounds bizarre, but I couldn't have. To be fair, that college today takes a very good stand on this. But at the time I went there, there must have been some sort of a plan or instruction to the faculty not to address this. Because I went to Bible college four years, uh, graduated with reasonably good grades, and understanding what was going on around me and never heard the subject addressed one time. I graduated from Bible college not knowing the King James Bible was based on a different textual tradition than all the others. 
And, and I mean, it was never addressed. What about the what about from a practical perspective? What Bible are they using? They use the King James Bible. That's what we were trained in. That's the only thing that was ever used in class. That was the only thing that was ever preached in chapel. So I mean, that's what I was trained in. And and that's what I knew, was familiar with. I, I went through a little bit of time when I, I um, started using the New American Standard Bible for my devotions, but I just, I didn't have a reason against it. I just didn't feel comfortable, didn't continue. I went through another period of time when I went through the New King James for my devotions. And again, I just wasn't comfortable without having any good reasons for not being comfortable. And I used to say to myself, well, this is because this is what you were raised with. This is what you knew. This is what you've been around. When we had Bible exegesis class in college, this is what we were using. And, and, and at the times, I said, briefly, I use both. I even, and I've had some friends throw it up to me. There is a uh, set of cassette tapes of me teaching the book of James out of the New American Standard Bible from that time frame. Um, but um, it wasn't, I wasn't comfortable. I couldn't have told you why I wasn't comfortable. I just wasn't. And so I, after brief periods, those brief periods, I went back to using the King James Bible. Today, I have reasons. And again, I would tell myself, it's just what you're used to, so that's what you... But it, it's something much more than that. I just want to make sure, are we still good on everything, you think? There's no adjustments that we need to make before we get too much further? When you're recording, it's a good uh, okay. shot. I mean, make sure everything's One thing I want to say, just for, for me to help, help me, let me finish my question before you start talking, okay. because if, if you don't, I just don't want your audio to be garbled with me talking. Otherwise... Sure. I might not be able to use a really good answer you gave me. Yeah. So, and I'll try to do the, the same with you. Okay, good. Um, the only thing is, at the very, very end, I would have him redo his intro because this wasn't, uh, I thought it wasn't recording, so I just hit stop and then I hit it again. So it's like it chopped out a couple seconds. We Other can do that. We can do that. Okay. That's the only thing. Other sure. Than that, we're good. Okay. okay. We're still recording and we're good? Yes. Okay. If someone picked up this book, The Unbroken Bible, what do you want them, like, what's the primary thing you would want them to learn or take away from reading this? Well, again, it was originally several smaller books. Each one of them had its own aim in, in addressing a particular question that was being discussed and debated among King James Bible believers. And so it is my attempt to address several of those things that were, shall we say, hot issues, and so each chapter kind of has its own purpose uh, in that. And um, I have the privilege of being involved with some of the, my opinion, the greatest speakers on this subject around, David Sorensen, David Brown, other men, who have written much more thorough and exhaustive books and several books and uh, do a marvelous job. I consider it an honor whenever I'm able to work with them or speak with them. But I, I didn't try to duplicate what they were doing. They were, the best, as far as I was concerned, they're the best. But I just wanted to address some of the specific things that I would hear the Independent Baptist Brethren discussing that were issues among them. If someone is ignorant of the fact that there's differences between the Bibles, do you believe... Um, the goal of the unbroken Bible, let me ask it this way, is the goal of your unbroken Bible to reach those that are unfamiliar with the, the King James Bible it, like controversy or is it to try and persuade those that are already have a, a pretty strong education? In that? It's designed to be helpful to those that already have a pretty strong understanding of this uh, with some of the questions that bounce around among our independent Baptist people a lot. So I want to ask a, a few more questions just in general about Bible translation and just how we get to the King James Bible. The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, and we have, you know, still some documents of Hebrew, right? We have the Bomberg Bible. Do you believe it's possible to reconstruct a Hebrew text from extant manuscripts or do you believe that we have to take the Hebrew Old Testament by faith? Well, first of all, most of us are going to take it by faith because we're not able to, to do any of that kind of work. People who are much more scholarly in the Hebrew and educated in that than I am 
have confidence that it can be reconstructed and that we can be clear about all of it through that. But uh, not many of our folks have ever dealt with or studied Hebrew deeply. My question is more, do we have the actual resources? When it comes to Greek, you talk about there's 5,000 yeah, manuscripts sure. and there's all this you know, physical evidence that they take and they try mm -hmm. to reconstruct the Greek text. Does that exist in Hebrew to your knowledge? Yes. Okay. Um, if we were to kind of reconstruct the Hebrew or we we're looking at the Hebrew, should we use the vowel markings that come from the Masoretic text or are the vowel markings up for interpretation in your opinion? I think the vowel markings, and I have to be honest, I'm basing this upon people I trust, not my own study or understanding of it, but I think the vowel markings are part of the text. Okay. What about in context of the Dead Sea Scrolls? If someone found an older manuscript of Hebrew than what we currently have in, ex in, in existence, say they dug something up or they found something, and it was different than the Masoretic text, would you give that credence to changing the Hebrew or the Old Testament, or would you, would you say that we already have what is the, the Old Testament? It's a difficult question to answer because it's hypothetical. Finding something older than what we found so far, how would we know it was older? Would, would be my first response. Somebody said, oh, we've got this and it's older. So it cra How would we know it was older? What, what kind of information would it take to make a statement like that with certainty? And so uh, there's nothing I know of that would cause me or the people that I really trust in dealing with the Old Testament to have any question about the Masoretic text. So just because something's older to you wouldn't necessarily no. make it more uh, authoritative. It certainly doesn't in the Greek. When it comes to the preservation of God's word, what does that mean to you? It means that God has promised that his word would always be available to men. He didn't promise it would be everywhere. He didn't promise it would be in every language. But he promised it would always be available. And I know that's controversial among some of the brethren. They try to get away from that. But uh, some of the independent Baptists, half of the independent Baptists would say, you know, God never promised to preserve his word. It's, but we've got his doctrines and his ideas. But uh, I think every time the scripture mentions his word, it mentions it using terms like forever or forever and forever or a thousand generations or heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So I believe we have a promise from God that his word is always available to man. Now, the fact is, different times and places, men have to work awfully hard to get to it. And uh, he didn't promise to drop it on our heads in every language in every place. But I believe God has promised that his word would always be available. When it comes to preservation, I believe that, generally speaking, probably every Christian, regardless of denomination, believes in the preservation of God's word. It's but they maybe vary on the practicality of that or the specifics of that. Most people would say, yeah, God preserved the Bible. But from your perspective, how, how much is preserved? Are we, do we have the thoughts of God? Do we have the every ideas? Word. Every word. I believe in verbal preservation. I think the book, chapter in the book is entitled that way. I believe in verbal preservation that God promised to preserve every word and, and when you say, well, God's concepts or God's ideas or God's thoughts are preserved, but not necessarily the words, boy, you have really opened up a whole new level for somebody to step in and say, well, I've got to explain to you how this is God's, what God's concept is here or what God's thought is here. I believe he promised to preserve every word. And I believe the idea of concept inspiration is extraordinarily dangerous one. And uh, you see, and I, I, I don't see our independent Baptist folks doing this, but you see folks who say, yeah, I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, but you know, the, the concepts have to be carried over into our own day and refined by our own day. And they come up with bizarre things. And the whole idea of the woke evangelical or the evangelical left saying that homosexuality is not sin in our day because we've had to refine God's concepts in our day. And, but we believe the Bible and is... I don't believe that holds water at all. You're just as well off if you did not have a Bible. Because at the end of the day, it's the Bible in my words 
the Bible in my thoughts. And it destroys the concept of a Bible that is the sole authority that we are all bound by. Again, thinking about just in general Christianity, most doctrinal statements will start off with a statement generally stating they believe that the originals were inspired by mm -hmm. God, God delivered and handed down his word to man. What good is that if we don't still have the words that God originally gave us? Yeah, yeah there's nothing wrong with that statement as long as it doesn't end right there. And you have to go on and describe what God has done after that. Because if God didn't do anything after that to keep his word in front of us, your answer, what good is it? Virtually none. The idea that an original exists somewhere that we don't have has no practical application. Absolutely none. When it comes to the preservation of God's word, getting even more specific, do you believe that it's necessary that we have 90% of the words, 99.9% .9 or 100% of the words? 100% of the words. That's God's promise. Some people would say God didn't speak English when he spoke to Moses. God didn't speak English in the New Testament. How can we have you know, the Hebrew, the Greek, and then go to English and say that we still have 100% of the words? Isn't there something lost in the translation? Yeah. Well, first of all, when God promised to preserve his word, he never promised to preserve it in any specific language. I think you would find uh, hundreds of years, maybe 1,200 years, what God was primarily working through the old Latin. Okay? Uh, God promised to preserve his word. He didn't always promise to preserve it in one place. And there's a certain amount of historical study to this. The reason I say I believe for 1,200 years God primarily preserved his word in the old Latin is because I look and see all of these great soul winning moments, missions moments, church building moments, people are preaching from the old Latin Bible. That's where I see God working. So it's a certain amount of historical argument there. I would say the same thing with English. Now I'm not going to say that God has only preserved his words in the English language. That's not mine to say. And there are fervent believers who understand the truth of the receive texts that long for God's word in other languages and there's projects going on all over the world today and, and I commend all those people. I am not in a position to completely evaluate what they're doing because I don't speak their language. Everybody that that's their doctrine and that's their intention, I'm glad for and I commend. But in English, you want to look through the last 400 years and see where is the greatest thrust of soul winning missions uh, church planting, Ben, you find it in the English language and you find it connected to the King James Bible. For example, people talk about the modern missions movement, 1790s and going on. And they'll say, well, see, those people weren't King James only. They, they translated the Bible languages all over the world, and they certainly did. But what Bible was being preached when those missionaries got saved? What Bible were they trained in when they were trained? Many, many cases, what Bible did they translate from? Few of them knew the Greek and Hebrew well enough to do Bible translations from Greek and Hebrew. I see even the modern missions movement, which put the Bible in hundreds of languages. I see the influence of the King James Bible everywhere. And so, uh, for whatever it's worth, my understanding of my own life role in ministry uh, was when I was 17, God called me to be a preacher and called me to be a history teacher. I've done both for 46 years now. And um, as a history guy, I will tell you, you look again and again and you trace the work of God for the last 400 years. You find the King James Bible. I would also say to you for about 1,200 years before that, you trace the work of God. You almost always find the old Latin Bible. So I would draw this as a historical conclusion. God was using the old Latin Bible through those centuries in a special way. Latin died out. I don't know of the old Latin Bible being used anywhere today. But um, you do see the English. Again, I'm not belittling the intentions of Bible translation works in any language in terms of what they're trying to accomplish. But I just am absolutely confident that God has preserved His Word, all of His words, in the English language in the King James Bible. And uh, I'm not saying He can only do that in one language or has only done that in one language. That is the language that I deal in. Let's say someone 
has the idea of, I just want to know exactly what God said. Do you believe that they have to go, like today, today they want to hear God's word. Do they have to go to the English? Do they have to go to the Greek? Do they have to go to the Hebrew? In your opinion, if I want to know exactly what God said, what is my best resource? As an English-speaking person, the English Bible. What if I'm non-English speaking? Do I have to learn, would I learn the King James or could I learn Hebrew or Greek? You can't, excuse me. I do believe you can use the Hebrew and the Greek and go there. Very few people know it well enough to actually use it at that level. Um, if, if you were in a different language, boy, there's some languages where great, great attention has been given to getting the word of God in those languages. There's other languages where you have nothing but a, a critical text-based translation. And that's sad, frankly. That's a sad, because there are people in those languages. They want to know everything God said, but they don't have it in front of them in their language. And that's a sad scenario. But fortunately, those of us that are English-speaking people don't have that scenario. If I'm English-speaking, and I have the option of the King James Bible, I have, and, and I have Greek, and I have Hebrew, would you say that the English is superior, like let's say the New Testament. In the New Testament, is the King James Bible superior to the Greek, equivalent to the Greek, or less than the Greek? It depends on which Greek you're talking about, but I'm assuming we're talking about the received text, and I would say the equivalent. Sure. So if we say the, the underlying received text of the King James Bible, mm-hmm. they, sh- they are equivalent in your perspective. Yes, they are. What about from the Hebrew perspective, the Masoretic text and the Old King James? Would you say the King James is superior to the Hebrew? I would say the equivalent to the, if you have the right Hebrew. If someone were to translate the Hebrew and the Greek into a different language, not English, mm-hmm. let's say Spanish or Portuguese, would you give it the same level of authority as long as it is accurately translated? Yes, I would. So from your perspective, when the Bible talks about inspiration, what would you say that means to you? Well, this is where there's a great deal of debate, even among what I would consider to be good people, properly defining inspiration. I actually believe without meaning to be critical, a lot of good people don't get it. They don't understand what inspiration is. It's extremely important to find your terms. I believe inspiration is God actually dictating His words to people either in Old Testament or New Testament times, to be spoken or to be written. And that I believe inspiration is the same thing as God dictating His words. Uh, That is not a popular position, even among some of my friends. Uh, There's a lot of use of the word superintendence. And and the idea of superintendence is, well, God watched over the men to protect them from error. I believe inspiration is more than that. I believe there's, uh, and I have a chapter on that in the book, but there's a great deal of information to verify that. For example, Solomon writes three chapters about what the absolute idiot is who is misled by sensual women. Who in history was more misled by sensual women than Solomon? I don't think Solomon wanted to write that. I don't think he wanted to write it at all. He didn't have any choice in writing it. Daniel in Daniel chapter 12 asks what Daniel 11 means. If you've ever tried to exposit Daniel 11 verse by verse, I don't, can't find a tougher chapter in the Bible to exposit. It makes me feel a little bit better that Daniel didn't understand it all either. Daniel wrote it as God gave it to him. Moses writes that he was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Is that what a meek person says about themselves? I don't think that's what Moses wanted to write, but God gave him the words. So I believe inspiration is God dictating his words through man. I do believe in superintendence, but I don't believe superintendence comes in in the discussion of inspiration. Superintendence comes in in the discussion of preservation. And a natural question after the one you just asked is, well, then what's preservation? How does preservation work? And it's it's interesting to me because I believe God made very, very clear what inspiration is in, in graphic detail. He doesn't really explain to us how preservation works. It's almost like he said, I got this. I promise you. I'll take care of this. My word will be here. He may not always use the same method, the same place, the same language, the same setting, but he's promised us, and and that ought to be sufficient.
I think it's interesting your view on inspiration and while I think it would be inarguable that at times the authors of the Bible are strictly writing what God told them to write. It's, it's just even in, in fact just coming straight from the mouth of God. He, he writes it himself even in Exodus sure. portions. At times in the New Testament, it feels like the personality of the author is coming through. Apostle Paul describes even kind of questioning if he even has the Spirit of God mm. in 1 Corinthians. He says he thinks he has the Spirit of God. And at times he even says that this is not the Lord speaking, this is me speaking. Mm. Is there, is there room in your opinion on inspiration that the biblical authors are writing in their hearts what they want to write, but it's in coordination with God's I, word? I, I do believe, forgive me, I do believe God sometimes used their personality on person. Sometimes he didn't. Um, James and John are known as the sons of thunder by their fellow apostles. How is, uh, if you're in a New Testament survey class, how is John remembered? As the apostle of love. That's completely contrary to everything we know about his, you know, calling fire down from heaven personality. Passage, very, very interesting, what you refer to about Paul. And, and I've been asked about that a lot. And that is the ultimate challenging passage to explain if you hold a dictation position like mine. No doubt about it. It appears to me that God used that, so to speak, as the exception to prove the rule. That he let Paul say there what Paul wanted to. And even for even Paul, I think, it was a little bit of a confusing experience. It wasn't the way it normally happened. And that he allowed that to happen. But in the Lord allowing that to happen, and showing to you that's not the normal way that this works. There's really not another passage in Scripture to compare to that that I'm aware of. So uh, I do believe God used their personality at times. But it's interesting because the, uh, like the folks who'd want to argue, well, 1st, 2nd Peter weren't written by the same person. We'll say that 1st Peter is classic Greek, but 2nd Peter reads like a rough fisherman. So they, they couldn't have been the same person. R really? Well, maybe God was using Peter to write in classical Greek format here and let him be some of his rough fisherman self in Second Peter. But at the end of the day, the words were still coming from God. And I would say that even in Paul's case, it's God letting Paul put his words in there. So ultimately they still have God's stamp on them. And again, it seems as if Paul, especially when reading the epistles, he's like even saying, I've written this with my own hand and like he's having a dialogue with this church mm -hmm. sure. as opposed to saying, God just is forcing me to say mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. Uh, so I guess from my perspective, inspiration, while includes dictation, could be they didn't understand that it was God's word at the moment that they were writing or speaking. Is, would you say that you disagree with that? Like does Paul know for a fact that God is telling him to write every one of these words as he's writing or as he's dictating to Tertius perhaps and he's writing or is it something in hindsight they kind of realize? Let me say, most of my friends would agree with what you just said, okay? But you were asking what my position is. And, and my position is I believe it was being dictated by God even as they were writing. Uh, for example, Paul refers to a letter to the Corinthians that we don't have. That, I assume, was a personal correspondence. Paul writing in Paul's thoughts, Paul's idea, Paul's best advice, which frankly would be pretty impressive. I'd like to have Paul's best advice on things. But it wasn't scripture. And so it wasn't preserved for us and it wasn't recorded for, it, for us. And, and as far as I know, nobody anywhere quotes it or addresses it. I, I actually go beyond the position you suggested, which I admit is the position of most of my friends. I actually go beyond that and believe God was dictating the very words and there was something different. You read among early church history, lots of epistles written by people and um, with various degrees of worth or value. Some of them were, were pretty foolish, but, but some of them actually have some profound things in them, just as men might write some profound things today. 
I, I believe all the New Testament epistles were beyond that and beyond that at the moment and written to be authoritative in a way that if I'm writing you a letter and I want to, you're my friend, I want to suggest to you this. That's, I can't write that authoritatively. It's my best advice for whatever it's worth. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, I just uh, was, was with a friend who, who took a church 30 years ago that I advised him not to take. He's had 30 years of great ministry there. Turns out my advice, good thing he didn't listen to me 30 years. I'm glad for it. Um, that was my best advice at the time. Turned out to be wrong. I, I believe all of these were beyond that. And they're written with that sense of authority, with that sense of authority, that this is something more. And yes, I think they knew. And I think those that received it knew this was not just another letter. Even not, even, not just good advice from a good man. When it comes to inspiration and preservation, so we talk about the, the combination of these two elements. If, I, if someone were to ask you, is the King James Bible inspired? What would be your short answer? Define inspired for me. It would be my short, I mean, I get that question all the time, and that is my short answer, define inspired. There's a lot of debate. I'll, I'll define it for you. Okay. Inspiration meaning that these words came from God. He's the author of these words. And, you know, would you say that the King James Bible is inspired in the sense that these words are God's words? Yes, I would say that. However, there's, there's a great debate today with folks who want to say God inspired the King James translators the same way he did the original authors in Scripture. I believe those are God's words in the King James Bible because they're the accurately translated words that God gave the authors of Scripture. There's a significant movement today that wants to say God gave the words again in 1611 in English. And again, my response is, why did it take seven years? I don't think it took... Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I'm assuming you'll just cut that out. Yeah, I would. Pro- I really liked your response, though. I think if we could have to okay. start the answer one more time. Okay. But uh, do you want, can you silence it just, just yeah. in yeah. case? We'll and call check back. your. Uh, it's an alarm, I think. Oh no, it's not. Did you want to check, make sure everything's good with the mics, real quick? Battery. And all that. Yeah, I'm still running. I think we'll get through in a couple more questions, and then we'll just reset. So we'll just start filming again and start. So we didn't just have multiple times. Well, I want to get through this question as one follow-up. Yeah, let's do one more. To start over all my questions, really good. Uh, and uh, I just want to do a quick mic check on your, if you could take it out of your pocket, that uh, little device there. Mm-hmm. I just want to make sure we're still good to go. The worst thing in the world would be that something wrong happened. Okay, we are good. Thank you. In regards to inspiration, would you say that the King James Bible are God's words? They're still inspired. Yes. They are the words that God gave, the original authors of Scripture, accurately translated for us. They were the inspired words preserved for us today. There is a great deal of debate and even division among God's people because there are uh, folks who want to believe that God gave the words again in English in 1611. I don't believe that. If he had, it wouldn't have taken seven years and all that effort and and so forth to produce it. And and if folks want to say that, I don't care. But some of them want to make it a uh, fundamental of faith and an article of division among brethren. I do care about that. I think that's unfortunate. And I also think it's been misleading for some of the people doing Bible translation work around the world. So yeah, I've, I've, my, my, my work here, I did the last 10 years is inspired. <laughs> Why did it take you 10 years? And when, when God gave Moses the words, Moses didn't have to go through a process of study and purification and counsel and everybody getting together and working on this together. So I do think it's important to distinguish, uh, but do I believe the words in the King James Bible are inspired words? The answer is yes. Do I believe inspiration took place in 1611 or 1605 or 6 while they were working on it? The answer is no. Some would call the idea of 
of the King James Bible being inspired, double inspiration. Yes. Is that essentially... That's not, my, that's not my position, but that's what some of these people are teaching. Yes. So you disagree with double inspiration? I disagree with double inspiration. And, and I also believe it kind of opens the door for the charismatics. They love this doctrine. Because if God was inspiring, inspiring things in 1611, they'd like you to believe in inspiring things in 2022. And I think it plays, unfortunately, into their hands. And a lot of them believe in double inspiration because they believe in triple and, you know, 27th time inspiration and so forth. If double inspiration were true, does that change the translation process into other languages? Yes, it would be if it was true. And then I've stood in the Hampton Court where the King James Bible process was started. I got to spend some time in the Jerusalem room in Westminster Abbey where it was finished, there's a seven-year process and a lot of people and a lot of review. And then taking the original work with a select committee and taking it to another location from the six locations that it had been worked on and, and, and where it's, the work is finally done, that's not inspiration. But it is the handling of inspired words. So I believe, you asked me, are the words of the King James Bible inspired words? I say yes. Did the process of inspiration happen in 1611? And the answer is no. What about the idea of someone saying they believe in preserved inspiration? That as long as a translation says exactly what the original autograph said, that the translation's inspired only because it's preserving the inspiration of its original dictation from God. I, I don't believe that's the biblical definition of the word inspiration. However, and this helps lead to the confusion, if you look in English dictionary and get about eight different definitions of the word inspiration, there's one of them that would fit that. I mean, that does fit a definition of the English word. So uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't look at somebody and say, oh yeah, that's terrible. You shouldn't have said that. But I do believe it can be confusing, particularly in light of the present debate, that it can be confusing. But it does meet one of the English definitions of the word. If, so I understand your position. You say the King James Bible is inspired. But it's I not, believe the words are the inspired. The words are inspired in some definition, but that it wasn't redictated in was, 1611. It was not redictated. You do believe it's preserved. Yes. So how is that different than saying, how is your position different than saying that I believe the inspiration of God's word has been preserved in the King James Bible? It, it all depends on how you define, define inspired. It doesn't have to be different. So I want to ask you a few more questions um, about the translation process. There certainly is when people bring up the Greek. Uh, that's a kind of confusing question because some might ask which Greek. Mm -hmm. um, there is some pretty well-known Greek texts like the Nestle Elan mm -hmm. and the Received text. From your perspective, how do you... Uh, differentiate the two? What, what's the difference between these two Greek texts? Well, the source text that they're based on is dramatically different. The people that did the collating that put them together are dramatically different and dramatically different in their doctrine and even their salvation experience. And um, depending on who you talk to, different people have analyzed this, but people will say there's, you know, 5,000 different passages where there's a difference or 70,000 words where there's a difference. And that's pretty considerable. And um, the study of the two texts becomes confusing because they have so many different names as you're reading through. And I listed 30 different names for the received text that I have come across that somebody used and maybe 15 or so for the critical text. And that helps keep everybody confused when you're talking about all this. For simplicity's sake, I refer to them as the fuller text and the shorter text. The received text, majority text, traditional text, certainly has more words in it. Some have suggested 70,000 have more words in it than the shorter text. And, and that's a serious issue. 
either somebody's taking a lot out or somebody's putting a lot in. And both of those processes are forbidden to us in Scripture. We're not to subtract a word or to add a word. And so that becomes pretty, a pretty serious situation. And um, there are a whole lot of reasons why I trust uh, the majority text, but uh, the fuller text. But you, you can't do what so many people say. Well, they're just, it's all the same. It's not all the same. There are dramatic differences in the number of words. There's dramatic differences that affect doctrine in those numbers of, of words. Interesting point you brought up is about the number of words. If you look at a King James Bible versus an NIV, I believe it's over 55,000 words different in the sense that the King James has 55,000 more, mm -hmm. the NIV has 55,000 less. While that doesn't necessarily determine who's right or wrong, do you think that's an important distinction that people should be aware of? It's a distinction you have to deal with. You have to come down on one side or the other of that. One has too many or one has too few. And, and there's no way you can escape from that, nor should we want to. Our desire ought to be to have the pure Word of God. What is your opinion the most reliable Greek? And we could look at that from a simplistic view of, you say, the fuller text mm -hmm. and the lesser text, or even more narrowed down, we have the majority received. Mm -hmm. We have some scrap discrepancy there. In your opinion, what is the most reliable Greek text? Again, I'm trusting on this work of people that I'm associated with that know the language is much better than I do. But the uh, Greek text version of the received text put out by the Trinitarian Bible Society in England. And I'm not sure exactly which version. What about the 1984 Scrivener? That, that would be very similar to the 1984 Scrivener, if not exact. Okay. Would you say that you uh, lean more towards the majority or the received text? Here again, you get this debate because for centuries, the term majority text has been used to refer to the received text. In the last 30 years, you had something published called the majority text, which was an attempt to end some of this debate, which was intended well by good people, but I don't think they got it right. So if you're talking about the published majority text today, uh, I would not... I think there's some holes in that. But again, I really wish those men hadn't used that term because for centuries, the majority text meant the same thing as received text. So I have many times, so I believe, you know, I trust the majority text. I'm like, well, there's this. I'm not talking about that publication. I'm talking about what's historically been called the majority text. I appreciate that distinction because I think that's an important distinction to be made. Modern versions of the Bible, such as NIV, the NASB, the ESV, uh, there's multitudes of modern versions. Are they using a different Greek text than the King James? Yes, all of them. And this is coming from a source, Westcott and Hort, is mm -hmm. that? Ultimately, it comes from Westcott and Hort with various refinements made to it with different editions of Nestle's Alon and so forth. And um, the, ref the refinements made to it are not unimportant but they all come from the same uh, fruit. Uh, people will, I know, quickly say, well, there's the New King James, which again is supposed to come from the majority text. And um, bless their heart, I knew some of those folks and thought they were good men who meant well. But um, I use this illustration to address that. Where we're about to eat and there's three bowls of chili set on the table in front of me. One of them has big chucks of arsenic in it. One of them has a little bit of arsenic in it, and one of them has no arsenic in it. Guess which one I'm going to pick every single time. It is true the New King James is not based on so completely on the critical text the way the others are, but it's also true that it has a little bit of the critical text in its roots. And again, I want my soup poison free. I want my Bible poison free. I like your analogy. And I think that most Christians, most evangelicals would say that the New World Translation is a corruption. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yet, my question would be this. 
If the New World Translation is a corruption, what separates it from being a corruption and, and what, what is the boundary mark that we decide something's a corruption? If we say we want to have God's word, what is our threshold or what is our metric of, as it were, you know, how much arsenic mm -hmm. can exist in our sure. food? Why, do, why would we say that the New World Translation is a corruption and maybe paraphrase like the message is not or the NIV my question would be this, where's your boundary yeah. as far as what's a corruption? That's a very good question. New World Translation, Jehovah's Witness Translation. It's amazing how similar the Jehovah's Witness Translation is to translations that are being used in evangelical churches. It's utterly amazing. And again, uh, is I have a message I preach a lot, five reasons why I trust the King James Bible. Number one, there's not one word in the King James Bible that is based on the critical corrupt text, not a word. And I don't want to get in the argument, well, how much can we do? You know, how much can we base? And, and the answer to my is none. And, and I talk with people doing Bible translation works in, in other languages. And uh, sometimes that's a difficult concept for them to grasp. Yeah, I don't want any of it. And I, I don't want to argue about how little there is or so forth. And so, uh, and frankly, it's, it's remarkable how similar the New World Translation in the NIV is. Even Bruce Metzger, who was a great hero to the folks doing things like the NIV and the Revised Standard Version, said the New World Translation is a good translation. It's based on the same text he's using. It comes to the same conclusions. And, and there's really two issues. What text is it based on and what principle of translation do you use? When you get to things like the message and so forth, um, or let me use something I'm more familiar with, something like the Living Bible. There is, it's not a literal translation. In other words, we have to phrase this so that we're satisfied that people can understand it. That's a translation issue. But you take, for example, probably the English Standard Version, it's the most popular of the translations I would reject today. And I have communicated with the editor of it. He's written three books on literal translation, and they're masterpieces. He understands literal translation better than anybody I know. But he bases it on the wrong text. So he doesn't make the mistakes of the living Bible in what he does. But actually, he produced one of the worst translations because some of the others, it's like in the back of their mind somewhere, some of the King James still works its way through and all that. He is literal. He's an liter absolute literalist. And so if you want to literally know what the critical text says, get an English Standard Version Bible, which in spite of his genius on literal translation makes it the worst because it's completely the critical text in English. So I, uh, my standard is real simple. I don't want anything that has got a word from the poisonous text. And uh, I certainly don't want anything where somebody was putting it in their own words. And um, when I, because I have a lot of conversations with people in other languages. I said, well, let, let's, let's go look at 1 John 5, 7. In, in, uh, let's look at Daniel 3.25. And, and uh, if they got those right, okay, let's talk. You know, because that probably gives me some idea what basis they're working from. So. Some people would say the modern versions are close enough. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that's adequate to you or do you want it exact? Exact. Uh, close enough is a frightening phrase. Um, close enough in its it, explanation of salvation, close enough in its explanation of the deity of Christ. I mean, what, what's close enough? Pure, the, and I like this phrase, and I, if I'm not mistaken, this is the name of your church. Forgive me if I can get it wrong, but the pure word of God. I, I, I want the, the concept of the pure word of God to start with. I want every word that God gave. And I believe from their own writings that that is what the King James translators wanted. The discussion in Hampton Court was one more exact translation. They used the word exact. Bible translation is not an easy process, and it was harder back at that point. And they'd been through this, struggling to get the uh, pure word of God. And Tyndale, I just happened to have a Tyndale right here that my beloved wife found in a store for a dollar. And... 
She was smart enough to know I would consider that a worthy investment of a dollar. She just bought me a Tyndale New Testament. But um, it had started with Tyndale. He had lots of limitations to work with. To start with when you're on the move because they'd like to kill you. That makes sitting down in, in the work. They, they'd been through a process. And uh, there was a purification process in it. The King James Bible process really starts in 1526 with Tyndale. They wanted one more, their words, exact translation. They wanted to finish the process. Again, that's not inspiration. It would have taken 85 years if it was being inspired. But it is a commitment to the inspired words of God. We want to finish the job. And um, that ought to be in every language. We want the pure word of God. And if it's demanding, will meet the demands to get there. If it places us in situations where people are going to be critical of us or mock us or make fun of us, then they'll just have to do that. I've had people tell me along the way, Phil, you'd, you'd come across as a pretty scholarly guy if you just weren't caught up in all this King James nonsense. That's not my goal to come across a certain way. Be faithful to the pure word of God is my goal. Other people have to figure out how they're going to respond to my being faithful as best I can to the pure word of God. That's, that's their issue, not mine. So in translation and everything else, but in translation, we start with this concept. We want the pure word of God. Let the chips fall where they may after that. According to the Bible, the Bible says under the pure, all things are pure. So we would love to think that everyone has sincere ambitions and desires when it comes to the Bible. Mm -hmm. However, in Scripture, it seems like there's a spiritual fight over the words of God. Absolutely. In the beginning, the devil says, Yea, hath God said. One of the first things we have mentioned from the devil, basically insinuating uh, that God's word's untrustworthy or confusing. Additionally, when Jesus is on the scene, the devil is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And Jesus responds to him in Luke 4, 4, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every, every word, word of God. Mm -hmm. That phrase is actually not even found in the NIV, every word of God. Do you not see, if the modern versions, all of them are the Bible, that there's really almost no attack from the devil on corrupting the scripture. Whereas if these modern versions are corruptions mm -hmm. and have a sinister agenda, then there's a full scale war that's Absolutely. going on. What, what would you say to the spiritual fight on the, 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 the Bible? Do you feel like the devil's given up or do you feel like there still is a raging war right. on the scripture? Raging war like never before and because he has more tools to use than never before. Internet, for example, more tools to use than ever before. And um, Paul warned in his day there were those that tried to corrupt the word of God, even though most of the new translations take the word corrupt out of there. In fact, it's funny, they take the word corrupt and they replace it with pedal or sell, as if the sin was selling the word of God. Of course, if you have a Bible that says that, you know how you got it? Something you bought it, it. yeah. Uh, but of course, if you were the devil and you wanted to mislead people, and I say, I, I think there are lots of good Christian people who mean well, but who have a wrong Bible in front of them and they don't know it. And they're pointing right, and I'll give you an example, I'm pastoring in, Chicago. I have a young lady that moves there. She starts coming to our church. And uh, she's faithful to church. I believe she really wants to do what's right. But she, she wants to talk to me after a service because she, she just doesn't get, she's heard me preach against homosexuality. Okay, she's been to a secular college and graduated. You can't be against that. And, and uh, this is not a bad girl. This is a girl that's faithful to church. She, has, she reads her, her Bible her New International Version Bible from the church she grew up in. She reads it every day. She's not a problem person. She's not a difficult person. She's not trying to contradict the past. She just has a question. She said, I, I, she said, I don't understand why you think homosexuality has to be a sin. She said, I've been reading my Bible every day since I was 12. I've never read that. I said, tell me what Bible you're reading. She was reading an NIV in which most of the passages that address homosexuality have been absolutely mistranslated and ruined. Now, I'm not blaming her for not understanding. 
I might blame the pastor that recommended her to an NIV when she was a teenager and wanted to read the Bible. I'll certainly blame the people who produced the NIV. But this matters. And I think there are good people who mean well and, and think they're doing right and they want to do what's right who must understand a lot of important things because they have a corrupt Bible translation in front of them. And they think they're reading the Bible and it doesn't matter. That's what they were told by people they thought they should trust. Specifically the NIV, uh, it's well known that there was a lesbian Virginia on Malika. the... Virginia Molica, yeah. There was a lesbian on the translating mm. committee, and I think she was in, in charge of stylistic yes. linguistics. So do you see that perhaps the NIV uh, even has translation issues yeah. based yes. on the translators? Even in her own words. She's written books on this. And she's written books promoting the very gender stuff that we're dealing with today. She was writing 30 years ago. She'd actually been a teacher at a fundamental uh, Christian university and then two Bible colleges after that. And then she announced she divorced her husband, announced she was lesbian and so forth. And um, she's written in great detail on these issues. And she's very clear. And uh, she says about her time on the NIV, of course, defenders of the NIV say she was fired when they found out about her. She's challenged them. She said, tell, tell me who fired me. You know, she says, just, it's just not true. Give me the name of the person that fired me. Show me the letter that was written or whatever. Said she wasn't fired. She said she couldn't change everything about the NIV, but she had as much influence as she could. Those are in her own words. I said, she's written volumes about the uh, accepting homosexuality and gender dysphoria and sex outside of marriage and abortion and the whole woke movement of our day she's writing about 30 years ago. And, um, oh, sure, it matters. Sure, it matters who translates your Bible. And that is another one of my five reasons, one of my five reasons I trust the King James Bible. Not that the translators were perfect. They weren't. Um, not if, if they'd been smarter, they'd all left the Church of England and become Baptists of their day. But every one of them believed they were handling the Word of God and that they were going to answer to God for how they handled it. There was none of this, the Bible in our words. We're the authors. We're correcting. We're redoing. There's nobody that resembled Virginia Mollencott or anything of that nature involved in the translation. And it, it tickles me, guys. Well, I, you know, a better translation of this would be, I said, seriously? I'll, I'll say this. I'll say, you know, I checked that out with 47 of the greatest language scholars that ever lived, and they all think you're wrong. And they usually don't know what I just said. I read a King James Bible. Right. You, didn't, you, don't even have, you couldn't tie these men's shoes. You were glad to pass Greek with a C. You know? And um, yeah, it matters. It absolutely matters who translates. And, and, and frankly, to address another issue, people ask me all the time, so couldn't we do it again today, get something with more up-to-date English, but would have, you know, be done the same way and with the same authority. I said, who would you get to do it? Who do we have today, number one, with that kind of scholarship? Who do we have that would be available to devote themselves seven years to it full time? These folks are having their income paid for by the Church of England. Okay. Um, who, who today, our movement's more divided and fractured than it's ever been. Exactly who would you put together that everybody would trust when you were done? Uh, God has not raised up the circumstances to redo it today. If he ever does, that's his business, but it clearly hasn't been done today. Would you advocate ever changing the King James Bible? No. Not I, me personally? No. Again, number one, we, we don't have the potential to do it right today if we wanted to. I don't think it will ever happen. I could be wrong. Um, you know, if somebody comes along and there's a day and they say, hey, we do have the people and we do, that's their business. But I can't imagine it ever happening in my lifetime. And this, actually some good people have tried. I knew one fellow that he did the King James 2 and I think he meant well. And um, you know how I got my King James 2? He was giving them away out of the trunk of his car because nobody wanted them. And the King James crowd didn't want anything different. And the other crowd... He didn't go far enough because he was received text. So there was no market for it. And I think anybody who, who tried something similar today, and there is a project going on right now from people that I think are probably good people, but 
I don't think it's going to go any farther than the other did. So no, I don't advocate that. I don't advocate spending any time on it. From my perspective, it seems like there's two major issues in regards to modern versions. One would be that of translation. Yeah. And the other one would be that of the source. Yes, absolutely. And, and when we look at the source, we kind of can also define it not just as received and... Uh, well, well, let me say it this way. There's another terms used as received text and critical text. Mm-hmm. What, why do you see the critical text as being problematic for the modern versions? Uh, well, number one, it's, it's missing so much. Number two, the people that collated it and put it together are not doctrinally sound people. They had their own agenda and they had their own motives. Thirdly, uh, the argument is big. This has been, um, you know, based on the older and better manuscripts. As I told you, I was misled in early years. There is so much evidence today that Sinaiticus is not old, as manuscripts go, that I believe it's overwhelming. Book by my friend David Sorensen, book by my friend David Daniels have both written books on it. And um, uh, I, I, you know how political correctness will pick up something and everybody repeats it. I don't think there was ever any indication it was old. People picked that up and ran with it because they wanted to. The person who transcribed it, Simonides, said he did that. He was making a copy that was going to be given to the Tsar of Russia. And it was a copy he had made. And he said that during the time people were first saying, oh, we found this old manuscript. Said, no, it isn't. I just did it. And, uh, but they had a lot at stake and they ran with it. There is more evidence, I believe now, that Vaticanus also is not as old as it was said it was. I just got an email from, t- emails from two different friends in the last week saying, you've got to get this book. I've ordered it, but I don't have it yet. It was written in 1893 on the history of Vaticanus. And uh, now it's not really old, the, this ancient manuscript. People kind of believe that because they wanted to. And... Um, one fella, James Bentley, wrote a book about Sinaiticus, which doesn't have the last, you know, 12 verses of Mark. And he said, this is wonderful. He said, the great thing about this, he said, now modernists can have their own Bible. He said, before, and he said, the fundamentalists have, you know, the endings of three Gospels. Let us have the ending of one Gospel. He found what he wanted. That has nothing to do with the historical accuracy and trustworthiness of a manuscript. It's, they found what they wanted. And folks rushed to label both of those as old. And at least in one case, they were wrong. But you think that's ever going to be admitted? We're the great scholars, you're dummies, but by the way, we got all of this wrong. That's never going to happen. And uh, I think that may turn out to be the case with Vaticanus as well. It's just that they're not trustworthy. And if if I can take just a moment to put it in this context. Um, it's one of the funniest moments I ever had. But I belong to an organization. It's not a spiritual organization. It's a more historical one. Um, Society for the Study and Preservation of the Majority Text. Using majority text and historical record. And it's just the, all these thousands of manuscripts. They're owned by churches, museums, individuals, libraries. And, and they're crumbling. They're at an age where they're falling apart. And it's simply about how to maintain these and restore them so they're not all lost or crumbling away to age. But after it was started and it put up a website, this monastery from Greece got a hold of us and said, you know, we've always been intrigued by that. All you folks are saying there's 4,000, 5,000 manuscripts. Said, well, we don't know where you came up with those numbers. Said, there's many thousands more than that. We have another 1,100 just here in our monastery. And so my immediate question, well, how many of them are received text? How many are critical? They said, they're all received text. Nobody would have bothered to have saved a manuscript that wasn't received text. So this gets out, and, and some big names, actually from down in your area of the country, so some big name critical text proponents wanted to go see their Manuscript. And they said, well, you have to ask this group in the United States that represents us. So we meet in Chicago. I happened to be pastoring in Chicago at the time. We're Italian restaurant, long table. Their guys are on one side, we're on one side. And, 
and uh, they're, they're talking to us. And the Russian Orthodox Church has a representative in this group because they believe in a majority text. They believe in the gospel, but they believe in a majority text. I'm sitting next to the bishop out of the Russian Orthodox Church that addresses these issues. Blew my mind. He's there. He's in one of their robes and the whole thing. I'm expecting this deep Eastern European accent. He's actually from Texas. Has a nice Texas drawl. Just blew my mind when he started talking. And uh, we're sitting across from the big critical text guy. And he looks at him and he says, every 10-year-old boy in the Russian Orthodox Church is a better scholar than you are. And the guy so looks done. He said, if you asked any 10-year-old boy in the Russian Orthodox Church, do we trust the 99% or the 1%? They would all get it right and you get it wrong. And then he goes on to say this. And I told him, I'm going to steal this and pretend I came up with it, but I won't. Talk. He said, the comic book people are better scholars than you are. He said, if you went to a comic book convention with an original, in good condition, copy of Action Number 1 comic book, The Origin of Superman, he said, you could get more than a million dollars for it. And, I, and since he said, I've watched and that's happened. But he said, if you went into a comic book convention and you say, hey, I've got an original Action Number 1, but the ending is different from all the other Action Number 1s. He said, you know how much money they would give you for it? He said, nothing. Because the comic book people are better scholars than you are. The evidence for the majority text, received text, is absolutely overwhelming even before we start hearing from these people in Greece that there are thousands more manuscripts than what we knew about. And it was interesting. The guy said, the answer to my question was we would never have even kept one. We would never have even saved one. You remember when Sinaiticus was found? In a wastebasket being used to light fires in a Greek monastery. Which means they wouldn't have saved it because they didn't think it was credible. The underlying text is mostly coming from, like you mentioned, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus. Mm. Even if they were older, let's just say, let's just say they were older. Does that make it more liable just yeah. because it's older? Paul's writing that people were corrupting the scriptures even before the New Testament was finished. So the answer is no. And, and the person I said that started me on this, he asked me this question because I'd use that phrase older and better. And again, some King James people would have ripped me up and torn me up there and I wouldn't have listened to him. I don't respond to that kind of discussion. He said, let me ask you a question. He said, if somebody made a corrupt copy of the book of Romans in Paul's day and was found today, it would be the oldest copy of the book of Romans ever found. And it would also be corrupt. Older does not mean, mean it is automatically better. That's based on the assumption that nobody would corrupt the scriptures, and you addressed it earlier. If the Bible is accurate, Satan has a war against the Word of God, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Again, given to us in great detail in Jeremiah 23, again, uh, 2 Corinthians 2, Paul is warning that people are corrupting the Word of God even before the, they're done, God's done inspiring the New Testament. It, it, and if you think about it, without a sense of right and wrong, just logically, you say, okay, I want to have my own thing. I want to teach my own doctrines. I want to build my own movement following me. What's the best way to do it? Have your own Bible. And in a day when Bibles are rare because they're all hand copied and everybody doesn't have one to check you, boy, it's not hard to do. You just make your own copy, leave a little bit out here, add a little bit there, change a little there, and all of a sudden you got what you want and you're the authority. A little harder today because 
if you put out something today, people can check it. And Bibles are abundant. Um, I have, I mean, I probably own 12 good King James Bibles. And I collect English Bibles when I can find them real cheap. I have about 40 different English translations, none of which I've paid over a dollar for. And I'm proud of that. I never put any money in any of them, but you, you find them all. You go to a garage sale, there's probably an English translation there for sale for 50 cents because people don't keep them. And um, yeah, it, it's, it just really would not, the age would not prove anything. Unless you, unless you just want to believe that because it helps you get where you want to go. In the process of the King James Bible coming into fruition, we had other English versions. Mm -hmm. We have the Tyndale, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. We have other Bibles like Matthew, Coverdale, mm -hmm. Geneva, Bishops. Some would argue that these versions, there's multiple versions then, there's multiple versions now. But in your mind, is there a difference between the Bishops and King James versus the King James and the NIV today? Yeah, absolutely. Because... And, and, and maybe I'd like to leave the bishops out. I'm not quite sure it was as good as the others in that line. But let's say Tyndale, say Geneva. They were all in line in a process based on people who had a commitment to the pure word of God. They're coming from the same text. Each one is building on what was done before, leading to a goal. Okay? NIV is based on a different text. The people who produce it are a hodgepodge. Um, some of them were legitimately evangelical. Some of them clearly believed in salvation by works. Uh, at least one of them was probably the leading advocate, uh, quote unquote, of the evangelical left for, for lesbianism and homosexuality and gender dysphoria. And it was produced, frankly, as a moneymaker. And it became that. So no, I don't think there's any connection at all. Some people today want to go back to the Geneva. I think it's un absolutely unnecessary. H however, I hate criticizing the Geneva Bible because it was part of a godly line that led to where we are. It was the last step before we got to... And, and, and it is not a bad translation. And the, the biggest fuss, was, f fuss about it was the notes. Um, there were some things in the notes that I would fuss with, certainly things in the notes King James would fuss with. There's actually a note on Psalm 148 that says the people have the right to overthrow and execute their king if they choose. So you get, King James didn't take well to that, and it wasn't an idle discussion. They overthrow his son and execute him, so it was not an idle discussion. And some people think that actually goes back to that note in the Geneva Bible, why the people felt they could do that. Right or wrong, the big fuss about the Geneva was the notes. I don't like to criticize it. However, there's no need to go back to it. God used it and used it and used it till the King James Bible came out. And then it fell off and fell out of the picture. In the process of the King James Bible being translated, there was 15 rules given to the translators, mm -hmm. one of which stating that they were used the bishops mm -hmm. as the underlying text and only allowed to deviate from what the bishop said, if the Greek or the Hebrew mm -hmm. so allowed. Do we see that type of rule ever have been implied to one of these modern versions? Oh, heavens, no. No. Absolutely not. They, they, they all like to say they're the new King James. One even uses a title, but they're the next King James or whatever. But they're not. Even, even the new King James it does not deserve the title. I believe it's a... And I actually had the chance to say that to one of the people who produced it, who overall I think is a good man. But uh, it's, you know, it, it's a misleading title because it's not a New King James. It injected a new authority in certain passages. And um, no, there's nothing like that. Again, th th there's an agenda in all these. And sometimes the agenda is just money. A new Bible translation promoted properly generates funds for a while till it fades out. So they don't, but, but often there's another, there are additional agendas on top of that in, in order to make some particular point you want to make. The NIV, for example, ruins many verses on salvation by faith and makes them salvation by works. Ironically, my opinion, the New King James, which was kind of produced as an answer to the NIV, and they wanted to make sure salvation was by faith and they, they, they actually had saved people doing it. They take, in my opinion, some verses that are actually about reward 
and change them to make them salvation by faith, which is not a help that God needs. I mean, it's not the wrong doctrine, but it's not a help that God needs. And, and I, one time I started to produce a list of English Bible translations. I quit at 400. I found out there were over 1,000 different English Bible translations, 1611. I was going to produce a paragraph on every one. And like I said, I, I said oh, I, I'm done. Like, I can't do any more of this. But almost all of them were presented as the, the one that's going to take the place of the King James Bible. Guess what? Most of them are not in print, and most of them didn't get to a second printing. If we get specific, the New King James says in Matthew chapter number 7, verse 14, it says, straight is the way, straight is the gate, and, and difficult is the way. Mm -hmm. Whereas the King James says, uh, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. Mm -hmm. I've even seen in John MacArthur's study Bible, uh, he had a New King James mm -hmm. study Bible, he takes that verse and then says, that's the accurate translation because salvation is difficult. While some people will say, oh, the, these modern versions don't, change doctrine do you see in, in in your you know studying of the bible and christianity do you actually see churches changing the doctrine based on their bible yes absolutely and i would say if i believe what john macarthur did salvation would not be difficult it would be impossible you know if you read john macarthur you have to address every sin and, and when people confront me with that i, I was have you have you addressed every sin in your life? Is every sin in your life repented of and out of your life? And Pastor Scudder and I were in Ghana a couple years ago and all kinds of different churches came to the meeting, pastors thing, but everybody and their brother comes and we're doing a question and answer session. One of the guys said, uh, well, you men are talking about Christian sinning. Don't you know Christians can't sin? And uh, I said, well, may I ask you a question before I answer? He said, I said, do you ever sin? He said, well, we're not talking about it. I said, would you humor me? And so finally he said, no, I never sinned. And his whole church congregation broke up laughing when he said that, because I'm sure they all knew him better than that, no matter who he is. Um, so to, to, for John MacArthur, it's not difficult. It would be impossible. But yes, you see doctrine changed all the time on the authority. And sometimes they say, but, but you know, there's so many translations that say that, as if counting them by the number provided the authority. So I've got six translations that say this. Yeah. Some people that say that doctrine is not affected in Bible versions, I think what's interesting, and, and I'm curious what your opinion is, if I were to uh, suggest to someone, or suggest to you, this is the Bible that so-and-so reads, would you not feel like you could almost accurately describe what church they go to? having no information about what church they attend. So for, Sometimes, exam yeah. for my example, if I said, I only use the ESV, what church would you guess that I go to? One of the big evangelical churches. Uh -huh. how, about, how about Presbyterian? Would you associate Presbyterian uh, oh, with be, ESV? It might be. Uh, that, that would fit the doctrine of the editor. I would suggest this. If you use the NASB, probably went to seminary. If you use the ESV, you probably go to a Presbyterian or a Calvinistic church, maybe a Southern Baptist church. If you use an NIV, it's a more evangelical, non-denominational type church. If you uh, use a Holman Christian Standard Bible, it's definitely going to be Southern, Southern Baptist. Baptist. And if you're using the message or, or some other more obscure, it's going to be a very obscure denomination. That would be a very interesting study. I've never studied it uh, from that angle, but, but I, I get your point, and that might very well be right. Unfortunately, the ESV has, has entered a lot of the big mega evangelical churches, but here's the sad statement that I'm about to make. Uh, honestly, it wouldn't matter if they were using the ESV, they'd use something else. It's, it's made inroads in independent Baptist circles that frighten me from guys that I would thought would have thought would have known better. But it almost seems as if a person's doctrinal leanings are very directly connected to the Bible that they use. It is. That, that statement makes good sense. Here's my question, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? 
are those their doctrinal leanings because they have that Bible? Or did they gravitate to that Bible because they already had those doctrinal le- leanings? That, that, that'd be an interesting study. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't either. I simply think it's, there's a correlation. Mm-hmm. And I think the correlation proves the fact that Bible translations matter. Yeah, absolutely, they matter. Your authority matters, absolutely. I want to ask a few more questions about uh, maybe some more specifics um, when it comes to Bible translation. Um, when we talk about the translators and we talk about doctrine, do you think there's room that someone could work on a translation that doesn't believe salvation by faith? Or would you say that there is a certain core criterion yeah, necessary? I, yeah, absolutely. I think it would be wrong. And again, I've advised folks on translations in other countries. And yeah, no. And, and you go back to that the formation of the Trinitarian Bible Society wasn't exactly your question, but similar to the point. The British and Foreign Bible Society had gotten to the place there on all these translation projects, and they had been very, very opposed by the Unitarians and by the Catholics. And then both the Unitarians and the Catholics changed position and decided they would help. And they began to offer quote unquote language scholars to help with these translations, Unitarians and Catholics. And uh, some of the folks involved in supporting the Trinitarian Bible Society said, wait a minute. And we, we can't trust somebody who doesn't believe in the Trinity to translate the Bible. What are they going to do with Daniel 3.25 and 1 John so forth? And it got so bad that they would have a monthly meeting for the British and Foreign Bible Society. They said, we're not going to open in prayer anymore. Because when people open in prayer, they often pray in Jesus' name, and that offends our Unitarian translators. So a bunch of them said, wait a minute, this is, we can't go this far. They pulled out and they formed and they used the name on purpose, the Trinitarian Bible Society. They said, we're not letting anybody that doesn't believe in the Trinity be a part of a Bible translation. They also said, we're not having a Roman Catholic be in the Bible because they don't believe in salvation by faith. So yeah, there is core doctrinal criteria. And if you'll look at the doctrinal statement of the Church of England in 1611, uh, they have a doctrinal statement that has salvation by faith in it. They said they all really believe it. I, uh, I don't want to go that way. Actually, that's still their doctrinal statement. And I'm quite sure they don't all believe it today. But the fact is, every one of those men subscribed to a doctrinal statement that taught salvation by faith. What was in their hearts, I do not know. But I think that you absolutely have to have some core basics. The Trinity, salvation by faith, etc., or uh, you're headed a wrong direction. And I have known uh, translations efforts in other countries be taken over by bad people because they were desperate for help and somebody came along and said, I'll help. Give you another illustration of why it matters, who translates. I went to 2001 to Vietnam. Had to go in as a tourist, but I'm teaching a class for Baptist preachers underground and have to spend a few days during touristy things till the authorities quit following and all that. Finally get in a class and I've been asked to take a morning and teach on a charismatic movement. Okay. So, and I'm being translated for, I don't speak any Vietnamese. The class has been going great. We get to the morning on the charismatic movement. I mean, it's just plain as day, something's not right. Four hours, when we get done, translator says, you know, our Bible doesn't say, he said, every passage you used to refute the charismatic movement, our Bible does not say what you said. So I get back to the States and I look up that Bible translation. Guess who it was done by? Charismatics. They had fixed all the passages that were a problem for them. I mean, it matters. And, and I'm not fussing at those people. They, they only had what they had. But, uh, I'm talking about the Vietnamese preacher. They only had what they had. But boy, it matters. And so I'm going through making all these points and the, the Vietnamese translators reading it in the Vietnamese Bible and it doesn't say what I said. It matters who translates your Bible. So some people that would say I'm a King James onlyist or an advocate or whatever label they want to give themselves... Do you see this issue as being broader than just English Bibles? Yes, absolutely. 
So it's important that we make sure other translations, whether that be in Spanish, Portuguese, mm -hmm. Vietnamese, also Absolutely. are using the received Absolutely. text. Absolutely. And, and the, our concern should be about the translators in exactly the same way. That is a huge issue. And it's an issue that I've been part of the discussion on. And uh, man, it's just, I could spend forever telling you all the things that come out of that. But I, I think, let me say, and I understand there are people who are in languages, they do not have a good Bible, okay? As much noise as I make on all this issue. I pastor in Chicago. God gives us a big Ethiopian component to our church. We're having afternoon services in Ethiopian, oh, Ethiopian service, 150 people. Great, great, wonderful experience. We're using a critical text Bible in our Ethiopian service. Phil Stringer is using a critical text Bible. Not because I want to. There wasn't anything else. So I'm not being critical of people who are caught in that trap. But, and this is, and I taught the Ethiopian people this, and they're now involved in a translation project. Our goal should be the pure word of God. Sometimes you have to have what you have to have where you're at in the situation you're in. Missionary goes to another country. There isn't a Bible from the received text. He has to do what he has to do. I'm not being critical of him. But a goal ought to be the pure word of God. And we ought to be willing to pay the price to get there. And when we have the opportunity to have the pure word of God in a language, that's what we should do. When it comes to the specifics, if I said, you say these are different between the King James mm. and the modern Bibles, what passages would you show me where there's a difference? Oh, again, there's so many, but as I mentioned, I always go, first place I go is Daniel 3.25. And with the most uh, the translations using a bad translation method are going to say a son of the gods because that's considered scholarly. And if you don't say that, then you're made fun of and you're laughed and you're mocked. And I want to know, can you stand up to that? Can a Bible translator stand up to that? And I give you an example. I'm pastoring. I go to the Philippines twice a year, at least did before COVID. And um, I'm pastoring in Chicago and have about 50 Filipino people in church. Guy comes in service one morning. He said, Brother Stringer, I need your help. And he's been doing a translation in Ilocano. He said they don't have anything but a critical text translation. He's been encouraged to come by and see me. We go we sit down. We spend hours together. Question number one, he's done a translation. What do you got? And I take a Filipino man with me who's from the area and speaks Ilocano as his first language. Daniel 325. The Son of God. Okay, now that, that, not only has he got that right, that tells me he can stand up to criticism from the other crowd. Okay, okay. 1 John 5, 7. He's got it right. Again, not only does he have it right, I know that most of the people involved in translation are going to criticize him bitterly for that translation. But he has it right, he has his doctrine right, and he can take the criticism because he's committed to the pure word of God. So I start with those two. And if a guy gets those two right, uh, I've got a lot of good feeling about him. And I'm willing to sit down and talk about other things and, and deal with other things. But I always start with those two because not only are they very important, I know that if you get those right, you get criticized. And so this is really my first question. Can you stand up to the criticism for getting it right? Because if a guy can and he's got this over here messed up, it's probably a mistake that can be fixed and can be worked on. But if a guy's going to surrender to the level of criticism he receives, yeah, it's, those sound like great tests in regards to is this a good translation in mm -hmm. foreign language? I want to put it in a little bit different context. Let's just say you're walking down the street and you run into Joe Plummer mm -hmm. and he doesn't know anything about Bibles. He doesn't know there's a difference. You say, What Bible do you have in your hand? He says, An NIV. And you say, well, that's different than the King James. And he says, show me. What verses or what places would you want First to show? First Peter 2.2, 2, I would go to quickly. Romans 1.16, I would go to quickly. And what would be, if you're talking to him, what would be, in your opinion, the, the most compelling argument? 
Why should I stop using this NIV? Why should I pick up a King James Bible? Again, uh, my message I do over and over again, five reasons why I trust King James. It's based on the right text. And so I would say, dear friend, I'm afraid you're using a Bible based on the wrong text, which is why your Bible is so much like the Jehovah's Witness Bible, because it's based on the same text as the Jehovah's Witness Bible. And then I would say it's important to have a Bible that was translated by the right people. Not perfect people, but people who are right in their handling of the Word of God and their understanding of the doctrine of the Word of God. A Bible that was translated with the right method. Okay? Not one guy, not a heretical group, not a handful of people working on Monday nights for three years until they come up with something that they can sell. That it had be based not on the right people, but the right doctrine of Scripture was involved in underlying it. They're not trying to put the Bible in their own words. They believe God gave the very words. I mean, the King James Bible translators translate passages in the King James Bible that refute the Church of England. Why did they do that? I don't think they were sitting around when they say, hey, let's refute the Church of England. It's because that's what was there. And then the fifth reason, it has a godly heritage. Look at what the King James Bible has accomplished. I do not sit and, and argue manuscript evidence with someone who's not in that field. I know people that do, but honestly, I think one reason I get to ask to speak on this so often is that I, I don't get, I try to say things designed for the average person to be able to understand. And um, there's a lot of really impressive arguments that can be made that I would not make to the average person because I don't think the average person would have the background to understand that. And then if they really want to go deeper in it, two of my closest friends are David Brown and David Sorensen. And I think they've written the best books on this. I say, hey, let me hook you up with these guys because they have really dealt with this on purpose at that level. Dr. Brown and I especially speak together a lot. And I'll go first and, and give the simple version and he'll take it to another level in the next one. And we've actually found out that works, that works really well. But um, I'm not interested in, in some of the debates that some of our folks... Here's the reputation the King James movement has, partially deserved. That when we speak, we're either angry and mean, or we're over everybody's head. And I know where both of those things come from. And, and they don't accomplish anything. And I should say, the guy that's over your head with a certain audience will accomplish something but not your general sitting in church on Sunday morning audience is, is going to accomplish anything. He may accomplish something in a seminary classroom. Um, and I, I think it's important to say things that can be understood. And the whole course of my ministry, right, wrong, or indifferent, other people can judge what I've accomplished with it, whether I'm teaching in a history class or I'm preaching or teaching in Bible college, is to take the complicated and make it simple. That has been the, what I believe God called me to. I didn't say God called everybody to that. So he called me to. And so that's what I've tried to do with that. I think if there's no practical application of good doctrine, it's not that, it's not that beneficial. If we can make really articulate, highly educated points as to why the King James Bible is the Bible everybody should be reading, it's not going to make as big an impact if we can show the average person that goes to church why they should use a King James Bible. Would you say that showing someone, just showing them simple di differences should be pretty compelling in and of itself? And I think it is with a lot of people. I get this over and over again. They've been told they're all the same. They're all the same. They're all the same. They're all the same. And, and some of them live with that their whole life. It's all the same. doesn't matter which one you use. The doctrine's the same in all of them. And I had one of the great leaders of fundamentalism say to me, he said, Phil, what's the difference? The doctrine is the same in all of them. We were preaching together at a meeting and he was the big name draw and I was the lesser name, you know, I was going for it. And he said, what's the big deal? And I'm thinking, how did you get to be the president of a major Christian university and not understand, even if you take the wrong position, not understand that this is a big deal? I've been involved a lot in the Spanish Bible debate Humberto Gomez is the fellow I trust in all this. But uh, I was talking to a preacher friend in 
um, Tijuana, a Spanish preacher. He said, look, he said, I don't believe in, in what Brother Gomez did because I believe in a critical text. Okay, I understand that position. I don't agree, but I understand that's an honest position, even if it's mistaken. He didn't try to say, well, it's all the same. It's not all the same. And, and we hear that so often in English. We have a generation of people who've been raised on it, and it's simply not true. It's not accurate. But I mean, I could go back to where I think the sources of all that is, but regardless what the sources of it are, we, we've had a generation raised on the idea it doesn't make any difference. And it, that's wrong, and it does. Apathy has its, its uh, problems. But I think there's also ignorance. Sure. And I think ignorance can be fixed. Yes. And that's a good point. That is a good point. And I think that if lining up showing people that the Tyndale, the bishops, the King James are saying the same thing, and these modern versions are saying something different, mm-hmm. that ultimately we have to understand the preservation of God's word has to uh, exist somewhere. So I want to ask this argument. If you believe God preserved his word, could you use any Bible other than the King James Bible? Well, first of all, I don't know any other Bible whose proponents claim it is the preserved word of God. To start with, that's huge. Again, going back to what point you just made a second ago, I found this very effective with folks who, who want to go into this deeper level. Take whatever their Bible is, NIV, ESV. King James Bible their Bible, Jehovah's Witness Bible. Well, I put the three of them out. Okay. Okay. Which one? Here's your Bible. Here's the King James Bible. Which one does the Jehovah's Witness Bible match? And again and again, they're in shock that Jehovah's Witness Bible matches their Bible. They would have expected their Bible and the King James to match and the Jehovah's Witness Bible to be different. But that's not what happens. That's a really great point. I haven't thought about that, but I think... I've done it several times. That'd be a fun study. Whatever their Bible is. Now, again, the New King James, that doesn't hold up as often. It matches the King James more often than it does the Jehovah's Witness Bible. But virtually pick your other Bible, and it will match over and over again the Jehovah's Witness Bible and contradict the King James Bible. And I've seen people just amazed. They're just absolutely amazed at that. They would never have dreamed that would have been the case. If the NIV is the Word of God, can we really say that the Bible's been preserved historically? No, because it isn't based on anything that's long-lasting. If, if the NIV is, is the Word of God, is it even meeting its own definition of preservation or does it keep changing keeps changing so from a king james bible perspective once it was translated in 1611 has it changed from then today not in any significance there have been a ton of spelling changes does that change the words no no god promised and that's the point i've made to people repeatedly god promised to preserve the words not the spelling some people get bothered by that because it's got twenty thousand changes god never promised to preserve spelling and spelling changes in the English language. And uh, so, yeah, there have been all those kinds of changes. There have been a handful of word changes. People don't like it when I say that, but it's just a fact that 1611. Very, but, but this is what you're after. They're, they're words with the same meaning. And um, it, it's a principle in Scripture, polysemy, that sometimes a word can have several different translations, accurate translations of the same word. For example, there's like six different Hebrew words for red, scarlet. And, uh, and if you ever translate that, translate that green, you're wrong. That's just that's wrong. It's not green. There was somewhat of a continuing purification process with a handful of words where they said, you know, this, this says it even clearer to people than this does. And like it or not, there's a handful of words that are different between the 1769 that version, edition, it's not a version, edition that we're using in 1611. But it's not new words. It, it, it's not new word, but a, a refinement of what, how we're going to express this word. 
So apart from spelling differences and printing press corrections, did the te- is the 1611 different than the 1769 edition? No. No, it doesn't deserve to be called a different version because there's not enough changes. It's not a different version. It's a different edition. Give me an example of, you said there was a, a word correlation. Essentially, somehow it's been modified or it's slightly different synonyms. What, what is this example? You know, I don't know that I have one in front of me. Um, Edward Norton, who uh, did a massive compilation on, on different editions of the King James Bible, has listed some and I've looked them up, but I don't know that I could reproduce any of them off the top of my head. There's not that many and they're not, they don't change the word. It's just a different a di- version of the same word. I'm curious, mm-hmm. are, are you saying the difference between, let's say in Oxford and Cambridge, one says thoroughly, one says thoroughly? Mm-hmm. Is that an they're example same, of what same you're word. saying? Yeah, same word. I would different say, edition of the same word. Because I would say that's the exact same. Yeah. Or there's midst and midst. Yeah. Different editions of the same word. Not new words. Different editions of the same word. As words evolve over yeah, time. Sure. So if, if someone said, one Bible said believeth, and one said believes, would you say that's a different word or a different variation of the D- same different word? Different variation of the same word. And it didn't change the text? It didn't change way. the text. So those that would claim that there's been all these changes in the King James Bible are misleading people mm-hmm. by trying to yeah. and it, over-exaggerate and, these variations. And they'll say to me often, you couldn't read a 1611 Bible if you had one. Well, I have two facsimiles, a big one and a small one. And, and uh, you have to note a few things. Some, some letters are shaped differently. That's the big trouble people have. Right? Yeah, F and S. Some are sh- but in a few minutes, you can adjust yourself. And I've done it when people say, oh, you couldn't read six. Okay, let's, let's try. Here it is. Pull it off my shelf. Here it is. You want me to read it for you? And, and I've sat and read from the 1611. And again, J and I, F and S, letters shaped differently. But in 10 minutes, anybody could get used to those and read the actual 1611 text. From me sitting and, and not knowing what you had in your hands, mm-hmm. Would I be able to tell which Bible you were using, the 1611 or the 1716? No, I could read it. Like I said, it took me a few minutes to go through some things and get used to it. But yes, I could today sit and read it, and you would not know the difference. What about, and this is an interesting experiment because I've thought about it. If I was reading a bishop's Bible out loud, mm-hmm. perhaps even in a famous passage like John three sixteen, do you think very many people would even know that I wasn't reading a King James? Not normally. And I'm not going to vouch for everything um, in, in terms of that. And again, I've never tried it, but normally you wouldn't know. And again, 1526, Tyndale right here. And uh, if it wasn't for the text being formed a little different, you wouldn't have much trouble reading that. And it matches the King James about 85% of the time, which for a starter translation by one man who's fleeing persecution was an incredible job. Well, and again, the difference between a Tyndale and a King James, most of the variations are going to be word order, sentence structure, as opposed to taking phrases out. Yes, that's correct. It is based on the same text. It has the same words. And yes, uh, at some times they would have gone through and said, well, this, this would have been an even clearer translation than what Tyndale did. But it's 85% the same and uh, readable. And again, it's, you see the same shaping of the letters being different and the same spelling being different and so forth. But it, it's, uh, it was an incredible start to the process that ended up in the King James Bible. I want to ask just a few more questions, not necessarily related to what we've been talking to. Is there something that you wanted me to ask related to the King James issue that you thought of? If you don't have anything on the top of your well, head, that's well, okay. Well, just the, uh, the idea that the uh, preceding English translations uh, from the King James basically all say the same thing, whereas the modern versions... Yeah. Kind of now, I mean, there is no comparison when you say, okay, here, here's um, Taverners, here's Rogers, here's, um, 
you know, Geneva. And, and so these are all... Di- they, they were all discussing the best way to communicate the same Greek and Hebrew words. That is what the... No comparison between that and the King James and all these versions today. And people like to point out that King James you know, said different versions are all the word of God. I, I would accept that. I believe this is the word of God. I don't believe something based on a completely different source that has all sorts of different men's ideas worked into it or the Word of God. That's why I say I hate being critical of the Geneva Bible, even though I think the move to go to the Geneva Bible is really uh, misplaced. I hate being critical of the Geneva Bible. I believe it was the words of God, and I believe it was in the line and the process uh, that God used. And I also believe there was a reason... So to speak, God took his hand off of it when the King James Bible came out because it was one more exact translation. But. So how would you, if I said I think that the English version before the King James kind of go from good, better, to best, yeah. whereas the modern versions are just bad. Just bad. I would agree with that statement exactly. So if we, talked about, if we talk about doctrine mm-hmm. and what emanates from the Bible. Do you think that we're seeing radically different doctrines or, or open interpretations when we compare the preceding English versions? No. Or are you going to get the same doctrine? going to get the same doctrine. For you personally... I, I'm promising you, none of the verses in the preceding versions about the uh, homosexuality have been messed up. Okay? I understand. For you personally... Um, like for salvation, mm-hmm. arguably one of the most important doctrines, if not the most. If you get that wrong, does it matter what you get right? Sure. To you, what, it, what does it take for someone to be saved? They put their faith and trust in what Jesus Christ did for them on the cross of Calvary. Do you see this as like a lifelong experience or as a one-time moment of trust? It is a one-time moment of trust. Once someone has accepted Christ as their Savior... Do you think they could ever lose that salvation? Absolutely not. And when it comes to the importance of of, of Bible, and this is just a personal question. Do you think that having the because if you look at a doctrinal statement, most doctrinal statements, the first point is going to be what the Bible is. Mm-hmm. Would you say that what Bible we have, or the Bible being the Word of God? as the most important doctrine? Well, I don't know that I want to label it as to what is is it most important. Obviously, the authority of Scripture, if you do not have the authoritative Word of God, you aren't going to be able to figure out salvation. Though I will say there are sometimes people who, the only thing they have is a little bit of the Scripture about salvation and they trust Christ. Um, I don't know that I want to put them in labels of importance, but... The, the doctrine of salvation and the Word of God. And I can fellowship with people that I think see that clearly, even if I think they're misled or even silly on some other things. If they get those two things correctly, I believe there can be some ground for fellowship with us because those two things are so critical and everything else rests upon it. I, I got saved as a 10-year-old bus kid. You know how much I understood about everything else? Nothing. Nothing. I had, I mentioned our Ethiopian church. One of our Ethiopian ladies came to me and said her five-year-old Ethiopian, five-year-old son, little boy, Boaz, had got saved in Ethiopian junior church last week. She wanted to know if I'd talk to him to make sure he understood it. I said, sure. So he comes to my office. and I said, Boaz, I heard you got saved. He said, that's right, pastor. He said, can you tell me what that means? He says, it means Jesus died for my sins and I forget everything else. I said, that is a great explanation of the gospel. If we're only talking about the gospel, you can forget everything else. Christ died for your sins. So when it comes to modern Bibles taking out passages, and and, and in the NIV they take out 16 whole verses, and in the portion of Mark they suggest Mm -hmm. that the latter section shouldn't even... Well, I'd say this. They suggest that there's not really any legitimate authority to it. Mm -hmm. Do you see any danger in taking out these verses? Of course. Again, the Bible warns us. 
in Deuteronomy and Proverbs and Revelation, every word. If you steal a word of God from somebody, that's a very, very serious sin. If you try to add a word to confuse somebody, that's a very, very serious sin. There is a Bible that the Christian identity people use, the white racism people use, that for our Fenton Bible, that adds a whole chapter to Acts, Acts chapter 29. Which is, by the way, where you can find their doctrine in Acts chapter 29. And, and, and people laugh at that and they mock at that justifiably and they say that's terrible, you know, that they, they added this. Okay, that's right. You don't get to add another chapter in order to get your doctrine. But goodness gracious, I, I've heard NIV people and, and so forth talk about what a terrible thing the Farrar Fenton Bible is and they're correct. But how is that any different in respect for the pure word of God than what you guys are doing? You, you take out more than you add but you take it out wherever you want to take it out. Fenton added it wherever he wanted to add it. You're still God at the end of that process. I have to be bound by the word of God, even when I don't like what it says. And um, whether it sounds unspiritual or not, I don't like everything in the Bible. I really don't. That part about forgiving everybody all the time, I wouldn't have put that in there. Uh, I don't like doctrine of hell. I believe the doctrine of hell. I don't like it. Has been my moment to try and comfort people who've lost a loved one that clearly died and went to hell. And, and they want comfort, and I'd like to be able to give it to them. And I cannot, because the book is the book. We have to be bound by an authority, and we do not get to play games with it. And once you start playing games with it, where does it stop? Going back to something we already talked about, and, and this is a little bit specific. If we look at the Spanish language, mm -hmm. um, especially where I'm from, mm -hmm. a lot of people only speak Spanish. Sure, sure. And there's kind of uh, two, there's at least one Bible that's really emanating. Popular. Sure. It's the 1960. Reign of Lerga. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't speak Spanish perfectly, but I do speak it well enough to you know, preach the gospel and things mm -hmm. like that. Our church has found that the, 16, the 1960 is very similar to the NIV in, in the mm -hmm. English. Maybe not as bad, but at least the same underlying it, it text. It certainly has critical text readings. And the very editor says that they use the critical text some of the time. So from my perspective, I don't like the 1960. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, you just spoke about the Ethiopian mm -hmm. situation. If, they, if that's all they got, they all they got. But with the, with the Spanish Bible, they have an Antigua Bible. Mm -hmm. And there's also a 2010. There's a Reign of Lara Gomez. Reign of Gomez. 2010. Um, what is your opinion on... If, if I'm a Spanish-speaking person... And I, 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 to, I've been around this discussion a lot more than you, than you would think for somebody that speaks Spanish. Um, and, and, and actually, where I came to grips with this, that there was a problem with the 60 illustrate what I said earlier. I'm hearing all this, and some people were saying, yes, it's, it's critical text. They know it's exactly like the King James. So I sat down with a King James and a Revised Standard Version and a 1960 with three Spanish speakers. And I went through 20 verses to find that the 1960 matched the Revised Standard Version 17 of the 20 verses. So that indicated to me there's a real problem. I've known Humberto Gomez from the beginning of that work, communicated with him regularly, preached for him, preached with him, and, and preached for a number of Spanish preachers that um, use that. Sort of the head of the Reign of Valera Gomez Bible Society, Manny Rodriguez, a very good friend of mine. He preaches here. I have preached for him. I preached for him in Puerto Rico. Now he pastors South Carolina. I preached for him in South Carolina. And I don't know Spanish. There's some arguments about the right Spanish word in places. I'm not capable of participating in those arguments. I don't try. I know what it's based on. He sat down with Antigua, the King James, and communicated with people who are fluent in the Hebrew and the Greek, who use the right Hebrew and Greek. So it has the right source. Boy, I can tell you, he can withstand the criticism. He's been beat up from every way you can possibly imagine for the attempt to deal with this. I've never seen anything like it in 50 years of ministry. And I know he can take the pressure. 
I know he has the right doctrine. And, and to be very candid, I know some of the leading advocates on the other side. And, and I have many reasons besides the Bible issue why I do not trust them. Okay, I know some of them well, personally. And um, if, if the Bible was no issue, I still wouldn't trust them because I know them. So Humberto I trust, and some of the people very deeply involved with him I trust well. And I know people who are, are fluent in Spanish and are godly people who understand the Bible. Rex Cobb, Baptist Bible Translators Institute, Steve Ziner, Bearing Precious Seed Global, uh, again, Manny Rodriguez. I trust those people. And so I would recommend, without any hesitation, uh, to anybody who wanted a Spanish Bible that was in the right line to use the reign of Lara Gomez. Our church has actually um, physically produced thousands of those, and that's what oh, we Oh, I did not away. know that. God bless you. So I, I was compliment curious you your, for that. Yeah, what I your opinion you was that. on that. I compliment you for that. Well, I have sort of been with Humberto through this whole thing watching him endure the criticism and the challenges and so forth. And I just have the greatest admiration for him. I do still think that it's possible that the reign of Larry Gomez 2010 could go through another purification process. And, and he does too. He believes that as well. But that it's uh, probably the best option that we yes. have. And, and folks want an answer today to all this. This is a big job. Again, we're looking at an 85-year process on the King James Bible. And it shouldn't take 85 years now because we have more tools, but this is a bigger process than people want to make it out to be. And there was a purification process, Tyndale to you know, Rogers to you know, Co Coverdale to Rogers. And there was a purification process in terms of this. But you, 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 you want to start out with the right authority, the right source, which they have. And you want people of integrity doing it. Can I believe in the doctrine of preservation taught in Scripture and use an NIV, an ESV, or an, uh, another modern version? Well, not consistently. Anytime you say, can people do this, we're all capable of being inconsistent, unfortunately. That goes with having a sin nature. Somebody asked me the other day, can you be a Mason and a, a Christian at the same time? Well, you can't be a faithful Mason and a faithful Christian at the same time. You, you can be all kinds of things because we have incredible capacities to be inconsistent. But I'm assuming you're asking, can you consistently believe that? And um, the answer would be no for several reasons. Uh, the people that produce it, NIV would, didn't believe in preservation to start with. And so they did not operate on that idea behind what they were doing. The idea is they're appealing to a Greek authority that is collated and put together in the 1800s and based on the idea that God's people did not have the word of God all those centuries before. So it's starting point is that God didn't preserve his word. And we're gonna fix what the church was missing all these centuries. That's the starting point. So I would say you could not consistently believe in the doctrine of preservation. And again, people ask me all the time, so, well, if you believe the King James Bible is God's preserved word in 1611, where was it before 1611 like there was no answer? Well, it may have been a lot of places that I don't know about, but God was using the old Latin Bible for centuries. There's no question about it. You see the work of God done, the Valdenses and so forth. You see the work of God done there. I believe his word has always been there. When you go to one of these, you're operating on the basis that God's word was lost for centuries and under the genius of Westcott and Hort, and then the people following them, it was recovered. So up front, uh, that's inconsistent with the doctrine of preservation. It was never lost. I would suggest that even in speaking with Bible translators on these modern Bibles, that they don't believe that they have a preserved every word and that we'll ever that's right. get there. That's right. So we have to constantly improve the text. That's right. They believe it's an endless search that they don't seem to believe we can ever get to the results of, get to the finish of. And I would find that horribly frustrating to believe. And, and again, I know men, good people in languages, they're not there yet in their language. They long to be there. 
Some of them are involved in projects to get there. Some of them, that's just not their ministry, but they still long for it to be. My Ethiopian friends, for example, I, had, I came across a guy whose ministry was to get a received text Bible in the, there's two main Ethiopian languages, but all the people in, that I pastored used one of them. And, and his, his goal, his ministry was to get the Bible in that language. So I introduced him to our Ethiopian folks. Uh, and that was right as I was leaving the church there, but they got involved with him um, in, in getting that done. I mean, they long for that to be done. And um, I have no criticism of them for what they're doing with the inaccurate Bible because they don't have any choice because they long to have an accurate one. But if I believed dealing with an inaccurate Bible was all I ever had could ever happen, that, that, that would just be crushing. To me, it seems incompatible with several verses found in Scripture. Many verses found in Scripture and the concept of the sovereignty of God because they will argue this. And I, I, I use quotes from some independent Baptists in my book that say, well, history teaches us God didn't preserve his words. Well, according to who? Or they say, you know, it was, it was such a big process. Seriously, the God who could give his words in the first place is not big enough. And, and again, part of, they say that they explain inspiration as superintendence. Well, God just watched over it. Okay. I don't, I believe inspiration was more than that. I believe inspiration is God actually giving the words. Superintendence is what he does in preservation. And I don't find any, any of this too big for the God who promised it. Well, where in Scripture, this would be a question I have, where in Scripture do we see any man of God, prophet, disciple, ever questioning what God said? Or are we ever warned? Because they'll say, well, you know, God preserved the doctrines. Is there a line in the Bible that even twisted and turned would ever say that? God, you know, warned. Well, you, you may not always have my words, but you always have my doctrines. You may not always have my words, but you always have my concepts. Where is there a verse you can even twist to that? And the answer, it, it doesn't exist. They treat that as a fundamental of the faith, even though they don't have the slightest intimation in Scripture. Because anytime God is discussing this, it's forever, forever, forever. My word shall not pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My word shall not pass away. And, and, and the closest he comes to limiting it is in one verse, he says, unto a thousand generations. Um, I don't know why. Normally he says forever. Maybe there'll only be a thousand generations. I don't have to figure all that out. But that's never the emphasis in Scripture, but they've made it a fundamental of the faith. They will laugh at you and mock you if you don't believe it. One other thing that I sometimes hear from people that uh, don't want to use the King James Bible is that maybe it's more difficult mm -hmm. than the other versions. What I think about that argument, it's to some degree uh, contextual because is not Tyndale and some of these uh, precursors to the King James Bible literally stating that they want the Bible to be in such a vulgar tongue, meaning common tongue, mm -hmm. that even the plowboy... Yes. We'll know more than the scholar. So at the time that it's written, it's not considered a difficult text. It's not considered a scholarly text per se. It's written in a common, yes. vulgar Absolutely manner. True. And if someone were to suggest that today they can't understand the King James Bible, maybe our society has devolved too much as opposed to it being too difficult. Well, this is not English language's best moment. I think if you're looking at history, that's true. Not the English language's best moment. But, you know, I, I'm a bus kid. And, and, and when I actually got acquainted with the editor of the ESV, Leonard Riken, to his credit, I had stated on the, something on the internet, say something, somebody posted the internet that, I said, bus kids don't have trouble understanding the King James Bible. It's only seminary professors that do. And, of course, I got attacked from a dozen different directions. I don't pay any attention to that stuff. Riken went on the Internet to defend me on that and said he came from Norway when he was 10 and barely spoke English. And they got in the United States, and his father said, we're going to start having devotions from an English Bible instead of a Norwegian Bible. He said he didn't find a King James Bible hard to understand. And, um, and of course, I wrote him and thanked him. for He, he had nothing to gain by defending me in that debate. Um. A lot of this is, are you willing to work at it? And um, 
That's the day and age in which we live. We want everything prepackaged delivered to us. We'll take half the truth if we can have it in a fashion that we can handle quicker. And uh, yeah, this is not the greatest moment in the development of the English language. But uh, do you want the truth? Again, it goes back to the pure word. Do you want to know everything God said? Okay. I, I, silly illustration, but it's illustration. I've watched this in Bible college over the years. A young lady gets interested in a young man. And he's a football fan. And so she's sort of going to pretend to be interested in football in order to ease the relationship along. But she's got to learn some words if she wants to understand football. I've actually coached some girls in understanding some football words so they can make the young man comfortable. So if, if you learn football English, if you want to know football, if it's worth it to you, guess what? Bible English, could anything be more important than that? You learn what you've got to learn to get it. And the idea that it should be easy or read like the daily newspaper, or boy, this translation makes it simple. What if the truth is not simple? Find me a simple word that adequately conveys propitiation. Okay? The truth is not always simple. And the King James translators had no goal of making it understandable. They were relaying the words of God in Greek and Hebrew. And so as a 10-year-old bus kid, I started reading the Bible every day. I just assumed the parts I didn't understand were because I was 10 years old. And it didn't bother me because I figured someday I'll be older than that and I'll get it. And um, I, I really think this, this you know, we're, we go to the 10-minute oil change and want to know how long it's going to take because that's our day and age. And we have to have a different attitude towards the Bible. It's not like every other book. Do you find it even true that the modern versions are just plain easier? Is there not several words even in the NIV? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes they're not easier. Sometimes they're harder. Sometimes they're easier because there isn't as much truth there. It's like the children's version. You know, because we, we've watered it down and, and you can actually understand what's there easier than you can understand the King James Bible, but because there's not as much there. I, we have to have a different attitude to the Word of God. I want to know everything God said. And if I have to learn a word or I, I can't figure it out today and I've got to hang on till I can get it, or I have to grow into it, the understanding of it or mature into the understanding of it, because it's the Word of God and this obsession with treating it like any other book. And that's been bad, but it's gotten worse with the Internet. Great tool. I use it all the time. But, you know, we, we want the five-word version of anything, and we want half of that in abbreviations. And it, it's changed the way people think. And uh, fine, you want to go through the day like that, great. But when it comes down to sitting with the Word of God, we need to want the pure Word of God. If it's hard to understand, there's something wrong with the Bible that's never hard to understand. Because the truth is not that way. Some of it is milk, but some of it is meat. And if you've got a Bible, tra and Bible trans, especially in other languages, they'll say, we, we put this in fact, it's easy for everybody to understand. There's something wrong with the Bible, it's easy for everybody to understand because it's missing something. If, if you were going to give us one verse from the Bible that is to you the most influential or, in your opinion, is just the most important into why you use a King James Bible, what would be the verse that speaks to you? I'll read it to you in just a moment. And it may not sound like it covers that much, but, but this is the idea. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. There is a different attitude we're supposed to take towards the Bible. I should not come to it expecting it to be something like everything else or always easy, or always simple. It's a lifetime process to get it. 
and, and the Thessalonians were praised because they got that. We don't receive this like it's the word of man. We receive it like it's the word of God. I know that has to lead to an awful lot of other subjects where you get to, well, here it is in the King James Bible, but it's the starting place. Attitude towards how you receive the word of God. Great verse. Thank you so much for... Thank you. Thank you for coming, gentlemen. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome.